Um, really what we want to talk to you about here are um, how you can work together with colleagues across these different units that, that are normally quite separate to create um, programs that are holistically designed for students so that the, the experience a student has abroad, um, both in learning and in doing anything experiential, such as an internship, can be fully integrated with the curriculum here on campus so that everything the students do will count towards the learning goals of their major and their specific program, um, and that the various obstacles that we come across in trying to build this kind of holistic program, which, which is quite complicated to do this across the, the disciplines and the units, um, where uh, you know, what we want to do is just kind of give you the experience of what we did to create a public health program in Nairobi, and then we're going to have a little interactive session where we're going to set you um, a problem to look at, um, and you can talk amongst yourselves, we'll divide you up into two or three groups to look at different aspects of a problem and setting up a similar program, and then we'll have a, have a discussion. Um, so, you know, what we're going to do is just explain on the importance of there's a kind of before, during, and after that you have to think about. Um, and so the important thing is to have continuous and very close collaboration um, because given the specifics of any circumstances you encounter abroad, you're always having to adjust, change what you're going to do, make modifications, make certain compromises, um, change your, your initial design of a program, um, and you have to be very flexible and you have to be able to continue to work together through all of these things so that everybody's needs in developing a program are met. So, first of all, um, our program in Nairobi um, was started in 2004. It was uh, my first year at AU and we developed a program, study abroad program in Nairobi for, solely for AU students. Um, it focused on international development, was primarily an issue that came out of SIS. Um, what we did there was that we had an on-site academic director and we had another program assistant. We developed some courses for which we contracted faculty and taught just for the program students. And we also had a local university partner, which in Nairobi was our first partner, the U.S. International University, so that our students could also take some courses at USIU. That meant that they could take the specialized courses on our, at our center, but they could also continue to fulfill other requirements that they needed to fulfill at AU by having a wide variety of courses they could choose from at USIU, and that helped broaden the number of students who could go on the program. Um, after the first two years, we, because we had been kind of moving around where we had a classroom we rented and we had an office that we rented somewhere else, after two years, the program was solid enough that we were able to rent a space to have our own dedicated center so that there was, uh, you know, lounge room for students and classrooms, more than one classroom and so forth. Um, that went very well and we have operated continuously every semester since 2004. Um, with a good group of students. So then we thought, well, we want to expand what we do in Nairobi. So many opportunities there. Um, and that was when we uh, tried to uh, decide that we wanted to have a program track, a separate track, a new track in public health because AU was developing a public health major. Um, that was a period of growth at AU for that. Um, the three-year program in public health requires that the students spend a semester abroad. And so we thought what we can do is develop a program at Nairobi with specialized upper level courses in public health. Because while public health is kind of a new favorite sliced bread and study abroad programs, um, it's really meant for students who don't know anything about public health and the courses are very basic. Whereas for our public health students going abroad in their third really term, of studying, they needed high level courses. They were coming in with the background, so the standard study abroad programs didn't have the sorts of courses they needed. And so we began to negotiate with the University of Nairobi School of Public Health, one of the top um, institutions anywhere in the world for public health. Um, they only offer graduate degrees in public health, but they were very interested in working with undergraduates because they're thinking about developing an undergraduate major in public health. So we were nice guinea pigs for them. Um, and that's when we uh, finally worked with them and finalized the agreement that they would 
uh, through their faculty offers a program in public health courses that our students can take and also help develop experiential components for the students by way of internships and other things in public health. <clears throat> So um, as Sarah said, the public health uh, program here um, on our campus is relatively new, and I came on board in 2014. And um, at that point in time, that was the first semester that uh, we were going to have students um, going abroad to Nairobi to take the, the public health uh, track. And I have to tell you, I was just thrilled, was super excited that our undergraduate students would have the opportunity to study at one of the, not just top schools of public health on the African continent, but literally in the world. And so um, it just was synergistically the, the right time. And um, I, I thought that the partnership model was really um, a wonderful way to do it because these faculty have the expertise that, that we're looking for. And so we were able to offer um, uh, one required course, um, our uh, Fundamentals of Epidemiology, and the faculty at Nairobi have been absolutely wonderful about um, making sure that their course aligns with our learning outcomes. Um, I will not sugarcoat it by saying that's always been just a completely smooth process, um, but with, you know, traversing some of the, the roller coaster a little bit, we've uh, managed, I think, to arrive at um, some really wonderful agreements on that. And then there are two elective courses that the students take. They take a community health diagnosis course, um, which is unlike anything um, offered really at any of our other sites or here on campus. Um, and then they can also take an elective environmental health course and um, additionally get to um, do an internship, uh, which is, um, I think, just a transformative experience for most of our students. I want to say that to reach to reach that curriculum in public health, it was a series of very involved negotiations. I mean, as I said, we, we reached the agreement with um, the University of Nairobi in 2012, didn't actually implement the first program until 2014, and in between those times, um, it was a matter of largely Joe Lynn working very closely with the faculty and with the dean at the University of Nairobi School of Public Health to iron out what really needed to be done and what they felt they could do and how it would be done. And it was a lot, a lot of work on Jobin's part. Um, not that it's not enjoyable, but it's a lot of work. Um, in addition to the public health curriculum, obviously when they go abroad, the students need to um, have intercultural education because they're going to be doing this public health curriculum in such a completely different environment. And so much about public health issues that they would encounter in a place like Nairobi are absolutely dependent on the history and society and the, and the political climate and the social climate in Nairobi, in Kenya. And if students don't have an understanding of that, they don't have some basic language skills because when they go out and do things with the community health course, um, they will encounter people who, even if they speak English, they're their main language probably is going to be his Swahili, and just having some ability to speak that language is not only um, an issue that we want all our students to be able to interact with people in Nairobi, but in terms of really communicating with people and showing your willingness to meet them on their ground, having those basic language skills has been really key. So we require all our students in Nairobi to take a Kiswahili course. It is also offered here on campus, so a lot of times students have already had a year before they go and they can take intermediate Kiswahili, but we offer it at all levels there. Um, we also added, after the first year, to another two credits so that they now take a, a full 17 credit load because in the first year, we didn't have the students take an actual history course or this course we have called Immersion in Another Culture, which helps them process what they're encountering. And the public health students, compared with the other students in Nairobi during the other program track who were doing those courses, were really at a disadvantage. And the students themselves noted this. And so we decided, you know what, we have to give them at least a potted version of the history course that we teach there so that they have basic knowledge of the history of Kenya. Um, and then also this immersion in other culture, which has the students um, really think about the, the cultural 
uh, communicative issues that they face every day in Nairobi and how to process that and how to deal with that. And it's a course that has the students meet and share and get guidance on, on what to do about that. So we've added those and students don't complain about taking 17 credits because they see the value of those courses. Um, I'm just going to talk for a quick minute about uh, the internship experiences that come at Nairobi specifically, but also um, in this moment, I'm just going to talk a little bit more broadly. Um, as you all, I'm sure, know, uh, two of the signature of the graduate experiences of students here at AU are internships and studying abroad, right? So it made a lot of sense that we should try um, and work together with uh, between my office and Sarah's office to, um, to try to make these internships possible uh, at as many of our sites as we possibly can. Um, and then in this particular instance where public health is the program that we're kind of uh, focusing on today, public health is one of a few um, undergraduate majors here that actually have an internship requirement, right? So again, as Sarah was saying, in order to allow students to have the most flexibility in going on these programs, we wanted to make sure that there was also the internship possibility. They could fulfill an internship requirement while being abroad. I know, uh, Katrina, in SRC, you have similar um, undergraduate requirements for internships. and. Uh, so we are really trying to make sure that these exist. And so let's just flip to the next slide. Uh, here are some examples of uh, the internships that our students have had while in Nairobi. I will talk in a minute more. You can read those for yourselves um, and get a little sense of them. Uh, but again, we go through the process of trying to make sure that since the internship is full credit, that the internship will fulfill both the major requirement as we work with faculty, obviously, to make sure that that's the case. And my office will advise uh, Sarah's team in terms of whether these internships are broadly meeting the academic requirements of, uh, of the university more broadly around the internship uh, fulfillment in terms of hours and the kind of work experience that they're getting, et cetera, et cetera. So we have um, a video here, a very brief video, which focuses on one of our public health students, Daron Shore, who participated in the program a couple of years ago. And um, this is a clip. We actually show this in our pre-departure orientation to all students going abroad because um, this uh, very thoughtful young man and what he describes is the kind of transformation that happens to students in exactly the way we all hope it happens for everybody. My name is Iman Sher. I'm from the suburbs of Philadelphia, and I'm a public health major. So I came to Kenya because I was still not sure why I chose public health. Um, I think I wanted to come on this program because I wanted to, you know, make sure that this was the right major and this was the right, you know, career pursuits or life pursuits. One of the reasons why I came on this program also is that I didn't know anything about Kenya or East Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa at all. This is just an area of the world that I had, I, I can, you know, say truthfully that, you know, I knew nothing about, right? Um, and that's what, you know, made me interested in coming on this program, for sure. <laughs> my experience in Kenya is that it's reaffirmed my choice to be a public health major has been, you know, my classes and my professors and also talking to public health and community health um, people within Kenya, asking them questions and being able to compare Kenya and America, where I'm from, 
um, and like the different approaches to community health and public health, being able to work with a community that isn't mine and a you know, culture that isn't mine. So my first day in Kibera uh, was very intense. Uh, it was the first time I was ever in a true slump. <laughs> I was very overwhelmed. I think, and this wasn't even just the first day, my first day in prayer, but I felt like I was in um, a movie sometime, like a frozen, you know, pathogen slums or something that I like see like glorified or like um, romanticized or, um, you know, looked down upon in movies. But to like witness it and see it for myself, it was just like, you know, there's a place where a lot of people live. And they have, you know, very different and real struggles um, that, you know, I had a hard time relating to. I think it's very hard because they, they look at me as like, Someone who's very far from me, but I, I really had, I really didn't have a lot of answers. Like I learned a lot here in Kenya, so I feel like I learned how I don't know even more. <laughs> This experience was really important because it was a big starting point. Like I'm interested in pursuing possibly like similar situations. And I think that now I'll be more equipped. Um, but it was definitely, it was definitely, it was definitely very intense. I think that changed um, a bit. I think I learned a lot about myself and about what I can handle um, and challenges that I can handle. I would program it because <laughs> um, I had an amazing time and uh, was able to meet amazing people that I would have never met if I didn't go on this program. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I never get tired of watching him. Um, so uh, a couple of the things I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but with you know the curriculum uh, piece, um, it, it did take quite a bit to uh, make sure that our curriculum in Nairobi was aligned with the learning outcomes we hope our students achieve here, um, particularly for the epidemiology course um, and the internship requirement because those are uh, core parts of our courses. Um, but. You know, it's been really, I think, enjoyable uh, to work with the faculty at uh, the University of Nairobi. They've been um, very collaborative and um, have embraced, you know, all of our recommendations when we exchange syllabi and have conversations. And, and I have to say, I think being associated with them has also helped improve um, the, the courses, um, the sections of the courses that we offer here as well. Um, another interesting um, dilemma, and I, I bet Sarah would tell us that this happens in other locations as well, is uh, our students have had to adapt to um, a different instructional style. Um, the uh, courses are not only taught by graduate um, faculty and our students are undergrads, but so there's that tension. Um, but a lot of the faculty are um, uh, more used to teaching in kind of a, a discussant um, uh, style. And um, some of our students, you know, initially are kind of taken aback that, well, wait a second, I thought you taught and I, you know, learned and then I regurgitated what I learned and told you about it. Um, and so that isn't always the, the way things are done. Um, and our community health diagnosis course is, is very much um, kind of a eye opener for the students because they go out into a rural community with interpreters and attempt to uh, do a needs assessment for the entire community um, in terms of their health issues. And so um, it's, it, you know, it been uh, challenging, but it's definitely worthwhile challenges. 
Yeah, and just on a, on a more practical level, um, you know, this is a great deal of work and it's happening across boundaries of, of geography and time zones. So that's why things can take a bit of time. Also, a number of the faculty that we have worked with at the University of Nairobi School of Public Health are very, very high level individuals who are often not available because they're off doing something with the WHO or, or you know, attending conferences in Switzerland or whatever. Um, it does require a big investment of time and other resources, including financial resources. Our financial resources in AU abroad are limited, um, and so the uh, College of Arts and Sciences had to help fund some of the travel, and that, that is essential. So it was essential for Jolin to go to Nairobi more than once and work directly with the faculty because you can only do so much over Skype, over email, over faxing. You know, you can accomplish so much more in two days on site than you can with months of negotiation back and forth uh, through electronic means. Um, so it really is worth the investment, but it's something that we all needed to consider and it's why we don't develop a huge number of programs through AU abroad like this because the investment of finances is, is quite large. And there's no way to avoid that and create the kind of successful program we have we have created here. I mean, this is really a unique program, and, and I think one of the best. Um, I'm going to just skip down to to the final points, and then I can let Dion talk about the internships. But we have to do a lot of work with balancing student expectations with all kinds of considerations. You know, they're going out into communities. There are safety considerations with that. Sometimes there are places that they've been going that they have to stop going to for a while because the, the crime waves, it's mostly crime in Nairobi, and it, it goes up and down um, in different neighborhoods. And so sometimes they just have to adjust where they're going. And the students have to be not only flexible in terms of dealing with a different teaching style um, and different expectations from faculty, but they have to be very flexible in their plans getting disrupted all the time. That things don't happen very literally, they don't happen that smoothly, and they've got to roll with that because everything they do there is valuable. They need to understand that so that when it's not quite what they expect, when one of the faculty doesn't teach for a week because he's presenting at the major conference of the WHO, they can't see that as only something to complain about, but realize that they're being taught by someone of that stature, and that, you know, while he's gone for a week, there's plenty of other valuable things that he did. Uh, great, let me talk for a moment. Can you skip back to the slide that had the list of intentions? Sure. Uh, so, um, is there anything you've noticed when you look at this list? And to give you a hint at what I'm getting at, uh, note that Nairobi is a center for many international NGOs and uh, UN agencies, et cetera, in Africa. Christine. They seem development based. Yeah. Um, what else? Like in terms of size and. Uh, I would imagine that they're not huge. Right. They're rather small. And so huge. that is very deliberate as part of the program design, right? Is that we decided we're not going to go with sort of the UN agencies and the Red Cross and everybody else who has an office in Nairobi, and but rather that in keeping with the public health program and the other programs that exist in in, um, in Nairobi at our program site, that the internship sites were going to be <coughs> all local community organizations and that students are going to get a first-hand work experience. It's not the, you know, the rich foreigner swooping in and saving uh, the Kenyan, you know, but rather that you're going to learn from these local experiences. And as you saw Daron in the video kind of walking through Kibera, several of those internship sites are local and often very basic uh, kinds of settings in which they can get acclimatized to what is it like to work under these circumstances when you have very limited resources, when you have uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, we, as, a, as the office here, we have almost no ability to form these connections. It has to be the good folks on the ground that Sarah has, has, and that is true across the many sites that we have, in order to develop these connections and to set them up. And what that means is that, um, again, in terms of flexibility, both on the student side and on the academic program side, in granting credit for these internships, there needs to be an understanding that in several of the countries that we work with, there isn't even the concept of being an intern, 
right? The, and even if there is, that concept might be different than the way we think about being an intern. So from the student's perspective, it can be a very different and rich experience for being different than what the expectations are in a workplace, what is it to be an intern, how are you being supervised. And the academic program also needs to recognize that in giving credit um, and the way we're evaluating you know, whether this is a suitable site or not, that we, are, we have some sense of flexibility in thinking about what are the actual learnings that are coming out of this experience for the student and does it meet uh, what would be in a bigger picture way the kinds of things we want. Um, can we hold Katrina till, uh, till the end? And then we'll have, yeah, we're almost there. Yeah. And so we'll take your question in a moment. Um, the next one? Right, yes, uh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Let's speed it up. Yep. Um, so, pre departure orientation. So, in keeping with that, one of the things that we have to do so, all the sites are sort of predetermined, right? And there's a list of sites. And so students need to be prepared before they leave for being matched with the sites. And so my office will work with students individually. We have a good system in place with Sarah's office. So as the students are signing up and registering, they are being um, advised to go to the Career Center and get their resumes reviewed and to have some discussion uh, with us, if necessary, about which sites to select among. Um, and they have some choice, but not always all the choice. And sometimes they're doing it relatively blindly, even if they do have some choice. And then when they and when they get to Nairobi, they have to go be interviewed um, to make sure that it's a match. And so the final determination of where they intern isn't done until they get on site. Um, and I, we just can't stress enough that um, it, you know having these uh, site visits are are really important. Um, as are, I think, regular communication um, throughout the academic year as well. Um, so, you know, best practices in study abroad and internships and risk management and safety, which of course Sarah's office um, thinks about a lot. But then in terms of my role uh, with the academic requirements, um, all of the courses that we offer um, in Nairobi um, either are aligned with the existing courses here uh, at AU, and that's a negotiation process, or for instance, for the community health diagnosis course, that was a brand new course. And so it went through the um, educational policy committee here in the College of Arts and Sciences and was approved you know, along those curricular procedures um, just as any other course would uh, be. And I think that's important to maintain the academic integrity. Um, and I think that doing the site visits jointly, I mean, going together to the site, that, that has proven to be key because we each come from our own areas of expertise, we have our own responsibilities that we're trying to join together. And when you're on site evaluating something, each person is seeing things in a different way. And so if there are issues that crop up, we're then all together on site to talk it through and decide together what we're going to do about it. Again, you just went one by one and reported back to each other. That clogs up the works. It slows up the process. And you don't get that immediate on-site knowledge and, and can and just learn from each other while you're there. It's, it's been, that, that has proven, I think, to be another key aspect of it. And we haven't been together to Nairobi for four years. Yes. And so we're going to plan to go we hope, next year. So we're saving our money right now so we can afford to go next year. Um, just very quickly, because then we want to let you do our little interactive thing. Just the final thing of, um, you know, afterwards, they really are these guys' babies, not mine. They, they, when the students come back from Rob, they don't pay attention. Yeah, to so it's all very sad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you all know that, uh, you know, among other things, experiential education sort of writ large is being um, described as really an educational best practice, right? And within that, there are the specifics of having had a practical internship experience. Um, at, you know, it's often described in the literature as like applying learned knowledge um, in, in real life. And that often translates to either internship or something like a study abroad uh, experience in and of itself, as we just described. And being able to go through this and deal with, um, to help the students then when they come back, to think about in a very you know, baseline way, like how do you articulate this experience effectively on your resume 
right? And that might seem very simple to my folks, but isn't always as obvious to the students how to put the best language that they can use to describe this experience, and then also how to talk about it most effectively as you're talking to employers about some of the broad skills that they need to have, uh, and that are increasingly the, the skills that employers are looking for in addition to having substantive knowledge skills like they will get in the public health uh, classes that they're attending. Uh, but things like, in a very broad sense, you know, uh, critical thinking, how do you work collaboratively, are you flexible, adaptable, creative, problem solving, you know, all of those kinds of things. And there are many things that come out of both the internship and the study abroad experience itself that they can draw from. And so part of what we try to do when we come back, when the students come back, is to work with them uh, to help them really make better sense and to integrate what they have learned into their broader lives and experience and in a very specific way, how does this affect your job search, right, and your uh, career projection. There's a lot of, there are a lot of several studies out there where employers really value this experience, and, uh, but, but it's necessary, I think, that students know how to describe it appropriately. It's not just having the experience, it's how can you talk about it in a way that makes sense. So, um, I just passed out um, this little thing where we'd like you to pretend that um, we want to develop a potential new program for environmental studies students in Thailand. Um, so what we'd like you to do is divide up into three groups, um, and the group over here on my left uh, will examine the first question, people in the middle can uh, examine the second question, and people over on my right can do the third question, and just give you about five minutes or so to ponder that all together, if you will, work together, and um, come up with the answers of what you think should be addressed for each of these three issues. And be ready to report back. And be ready to report back. <laughs> How many groups are we? Three. 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 Three.
But all my staff is some of them. And you know, of course, like bus and also And apparently this actually is quite true of that's actually So I have to change I told him when I saw him, I said this last year. How are you all doing with your discussions? Shall we come back or do you all want another minute? We're ready. One more? One more minute. Okay. Yeah. Or is it just a play? 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 Play?
All right, it sounds like people have come to some conclusion. So I'm going to talk about paper wrap up. Do you all want to start us off? You all want the first group for the pre pre orientation or pre departure, I guess? So we were. Um, with specifically regarding the internship component. And do you want us to share a little bit perhaps about like what each of your, you know, who you are in the room, and since we have a small group here, I think that might be helpful as well as we're thinking about kind of what the perspectives are bringing to the table. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Gettings, and I'm the Director of International Programs and Partnerships in the School of International Service. I'm Jessica Mercy. I'm actually an MFA student in filmmaking at the School of Communication. Uh, David Barlett Kogod uh, was previously the director of the MBA program and ran a, a lot of, uh, of uh, study abroad programs and now involved in the sustainability program at Kogod that also has an international component. So, so we um, thought that it would be really important, um, well, really right off the bat, to ensure that students uh, have cultural competencies with the groups that they'll be working with on the ground. To, really understand that working in Thailand and with a Thai-based organization is going to look very different than working with a group based in Washington, D.C., or perhaps in other places where they've had internships in the West. So having cultural training and such would be really important. To describe up front of what the deliverables will be for them to work on and that expectations are managed accordingly. In some of our experiences, we've shared that in a lot of and we mentioned, we touched upon this in your presentation, that the group on the ground may be very small compared to what they're used to here. So students may be expected to do a lot more and bring a lot to the table because groups on the ground are doing a lot with few resources. So ensuring that the deliverables and the tangibles are definitely on the front end, very clear. And then with the faculty, we know that it would be important to have them understand what um, the students would be doing and that the, it would, they would be evaluated accordingly with that and that uh, they understood and had a clear expectation and understanding what students were doing on the ground, utilizing partners on campus. So we mentioned the Center for Environmental Filmmaking might be a really good partner on campus to connect with groups on the ground and then the faculty and the internship partners on the ground could build that relationship. So each time students come, there is a sense of continuity between the partnerships. And then finally, in addition to the training and pre-reading, leveraging resources in DC, whether that be cultural groups or embassies or other sorts of issues. 
specifically because a lot of it's not just environmental development, but there are other components to it that we should think about in a non-Western context that they may be intersectional in a way that they wouldn't necessarily be here. Is it tied, or environmental issues in Thailand tied specifically to human rights in some way that they may not be here? So thinking about the intersectional nature of these. Thanks. Thank you very much. Group two. I'm going to say who you, who you are and Okay, well, I'm Michael Brody. I'm an adjunct in environmental science. Oh, it's and, perfect. Uh, perfect. <laughs> so I'm doing, yeah. I've been doing some consulting for the World Bank on Laos right next to Oh, wow. And then a couple of years ago, I was a Fulbright in Uzbekistan. I spent the summer in Kyrgyzstan. There's one of your SIS students at the university where I was at for the summer. So I think this would be a great idea, actually, in general. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Rachel Smith. I'm a grad student in the International Training Education Program, and I'm working in the Center for Community Engagement and Service. I'm Katarina Kawaigana. Um, I'm the Assistant Dean for um, the Graduate Academic Services Office at the School of Communication. So I work with um, prospective students, grad students, and graduate students. Uh, so our question was, I guess I was assigned this goes for us, but I took notes. Um, how do we align the expectations of the home department with the imperatives of the program on site? And you know what we miss? We, we miss the keyword during the study <laughs> Because when we're talking, I think we had, we were talking about things before. Well, that's the study. Study. Yeah. 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 So we because we have an expert in the house, right? So we immediately kind of focus on the academic component. Um, and of course, there are many other aspects of it in terms of where the students are going to be living and you know all of that. So we didn't touch base about that. But um, the academics. So Michael said that uh, because the core science is the same uh, around the world on this topic, more or less, uh, that we could keep the the curriculum uh, that we teach here. And then have the local case studies infused so the students would get perspectives like the international perspective versus a domestic perspective that they would get here in the US by taking the same course. Um, so I try to push a little bit to see what if we have faculty um, who have sh don't share the same view of environmental science with a partner institution over there in Thailand. But Michael seems to think that every, pretty much everybody's on the same page and that we can. You know, Google check or check their reference, check their publications and such. Um, but the question would be should we have our students, should we push our students a little bit to hear a different perspective from what they would get here? So they would get you know, that learning outcome would, it, it would be different, right? Versus from what they would be getting here by taking Michael's course, for example. So that's kind of something we would, we would have to determine. Um, and then uh, Michael said that it's best if the partner uh, faculty, the faculty from the partner institution will would teach this course um, since they're on the ground and they have more insight on uh, geographic location and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was kind of where we landed, and we also we also talked about uh, the, the duration for this. Startup should should we right off the bat should we do it as a semester long program or should we do like a ten day trip um, spring break commercial trip or uh, for graduate students like over December you know break so 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 they could participate uh, so that's what we also discussed how how long should it be should we invest resources and time to setting something up that we don't know would work initially or should we Try a little bit of you know the short term version first, and then do a long term version. Great. And group three. Sure. Um, I'm Elise Goss Alexander. I'm the graduate career advisor at the SIS Office of Career Development. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Wilner. I work with Panang Niwe. It's a um, special program in the School of Education for Panamanian teachers. Oh, cool. Thanks. Hi, I'm Cassandra. I'm a grad student, and I also work as a consultant with CPRA. Great. 
So we um, had a lot of, we were thinking about a lot of things and had a hard time sort of quantifying anything. But um, Cassandra mentioned that it would be really great to um, talk with faculty ahead of time about what courses students would be taking after they return um, and to the extent possible find ways that the information or the perspectives or the skills that students develop abroad would be essential in or or could be really um, a useful part of the course that they're the courses that they're taking after they return um, and Elise was talking about um, ways that we could work with Career Center um, to integrate um, or to include the experience, like like we were talking about earlier, in in useful and illustrative ways in their CVs or their resumes or or their cover letters or interviews or whatever it is that they're doing after they graduate. Um, and we were all sort of talking a little bit about how do you foster experiences or places where students who have returned from these experiences can share their experience in a meaningful way with students who are maybe freshmen or thinking about doing it so that it's not just like a slideshow where I went to Thailand and I learned these things and this is what's happening with the environment in this country, but where it's really like I lived with this family and it was an amazing experience or I lived with this family and it was a terrible experience and you know, how can you, do you set it up where return people, return students come and do like a day in a freshman course so that they have, like instead of the professor lecturing that day, it's more of a discussion with these people who have just gotten back from this experience or um, do you have people who are interested to attend like a pizza information session or, you know, like how do you, how do you foster that? We didn't really arrive at a very useful conclusion, but um, we all sort of felt like it was useful for for that sharing to happen among students with faculty and then with potential employers. Well, that's that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm I feel very gratified at all of your your thoughtfulness and and the way in which you you grapple with these issues and and come up with with a lot of the same considerations that that we three did when we were setting up the program. I mean. Uh, for group two, you know, to talk about the importance of being taught by local faculty. That's that's one of the central beliefs of the AU Abroad Office, is that our students should be taught by local faculty. And as much as possible, even within a local educational system, you know, this has been one of the challenges with the University of Nairobi, <coughs> which basically follows a British model of education. So, you know, it's a different educational culture that the kids have to engage with and our faculty have to be okay with that. This is one of the struggles when, you know, a lot about the AU core is that it's about the way it's taught and being very strict about the way syllabi have to be organized and the kinds of assessments that have to be done. Well, other educational systems don't do it that way. They have their own very stringent rules about how things need to be done. And our feeling is, is that this is part of helping our students learn how to think and work in flexible ways that it's mind expanding to engage with a different system academically and understand it's part of their culture that means a lot to them that they believe in. And it works in its own way. And students may like it or not like it, and some of them love the educational system in Europe and others hate it. And we find the same thing with our incoming exchange students, that some of them love the US system and some of them hate it. You know, but that's you know that's what makes horse racing. And I think it's part of what students need to learn. But also about the perspectives of local people. It's why, you know, I'll say initially when we set up the Nairobi program, one of the attractions of Nairobi was that all the major NGOs had headquarters in. We thought, oh, it's great. Our kids can go work for UNHCR. They can work for the Red Cross. It's going to be wonderful. And I went on the first site visit with colleagues from SIS and very quickly, first of all, learned that the big NGOs don't want undergraduate interns for a semester. That's a waste of their time. So they were not very keen on it. But we also realized that it was sending a kind of message about how we want them to think about development, which we weren't that happy with, this idea of the white savior coming in and telling people what to do. When the Kenyans running these little NGOs are highly qualified, highly educated, highly knowledgeable people, and they know what to do. They may lack resources, but they, they, they know what they're doing. 
And we want our students to learn from Kenyans. Uh, we don't want them to go in to help the Kenyans. We want them to go in and learn from the Kenyans. And this is very much a part of our ethos, which, which you know, stems out of the way SIS and other units that we like to teach as well. So that's a really important part. Um, Can I just jump in, Sarah, yeah. and add, add another point uh, that didn't really come up uh, either in our presentation or in your discussion. But in creating these internships, uh, this is less of an issue in Kenya, but in many of the sites, if the, uh, in other sites that we work with, and this would likely be the case in Thailand, uh, if you're working with a local organization and you don't speak the local language in a certain level of fluency, you're going to not really be able to do that internship, right? So we do have this issue, like when we, uh, we have programs in Brussels, for example, right? or in Spain, uh, where the organizations themselves might not have the same culture of interning. So that's a barrier as a first step to obtaining internships for your students, right, as they're going there. But then it's further limited by the fact that in Brussels, for example, there are three languages of note uh, in the country. And so I get Flemish, I mean, like, likelihood of, you know, our students having sufficient fluency to be able to function in Flemish is relatively low. And so to find sufficient quality internships that are English speaking is immediately putting a constraint on the number and availability and, and so on and so on. Um, so that is an important consideration. It's great that with Kenya, the students are getting Aki Swahili, and in Spain they will be taking, you know, Spanish at a basic level if they don't already have some level of engagement with Spanish, that will then allow them to uh, to go into the field. I have to say, I give the program directors on site enormous credit for being very creative in forming these partnerships with organizations and finding the, you know, organizations that that both would benefit from having an intern and are willing to have an intern and where our students can appropriately have that experience in that context. Yes. Yeah, oh, sorry. Really. Yes. Yes. No, sorry. <laughs> we have forgotten about yeah. um, So if a student is going on study abroad and they're fluent in the language, uh, if you don't have internships set up, in that location, is it on the students to find an internship, or just because it's an excellent out? question? Yeah, it that that so like everything else, it kind of depends. If they just want to do something in their free time for their own enrichment, you know, we we can help. I mean, the local people can maybe help them, maybe make sure they just don't get themselves in any kind of trouble. If they want to do it as part of their program, get credit for it here. Uh, we don't let it be up to the student because there are so many things that the site supervisors have to do that have to be provided and the sites have to be evaluated um, by the, the local staff. Is, is this a suitable place for a student? Are they really going to get the kind of work? And are the is the site supervisor going to engage and do all of the evaluations that they have to do? They don't grade the student, but they, they have to provide all kinds of documentation and it's a lot of work for them. Um, so yeah, we sometimes do have students, uh, it doesn't happen so much in the way you describe, but I'm thinking for a place like London, where a student will go and say, well, my dad, you know, has a friend who works for Goldman Sachs in London, and they're going to give me an internship, and I'm just going to do that. And we say, no, you actually can't do that. Um, uh, you have to do one of the, and we've had the same thing in Kenya, where a student will say, well, I have already established my own little NGO up in some place where I'm, you know, sending them money for a school and I want to do my internship there. I'm like, no, you have to do the one in Nairobi. In part because there's there's a, a some of a very important difference in the internship abroad for most of our students, which is it's not so much about the kind of work they're doing and the work placement um, in terms of what they think they want their career to be at this stage in their life. It's about the cultural experience of working with local people, understanding that work cultures are different abroad and how do they do that. And also getting them away from their American group so that they're in with local people on a regular basis every week, interacting with them and maybe hopefully as the only American in that office or in that, that location. Um, so that we tell students, if you don't get exactly the internship you think you want, 
this is a, again, it's the learning experience and it's the cultural experience, and that's the main value of it for them. Um, and again, when, when talking to our, our on site directors when they're doing these internships, it is working with the site supervisors to make them realize that they're also teachers, that this isn't about getting free help. This is about you engaging with that student to teach them something. And they have to be willing to put in that time and see the value in that. And, and that's what's been one of the very rewarding things, certainly in Nairobi, is the enthusiasm with which the local NGOs have engaged with us and our students and seeing themselves as teachers. I mean, we, we try to reinforce that as much as we can, but that's how we describe it to them. Our students are there to learn. This is part of their learning, and you are essentially a teacher. You're getting something you know, for nothing, which is someone to help you, but but you are giving us much more than you're giving back to yeah. And these on-site directors, you have them in every location? Um, everywhere where there's an internship as part of the credit-bearing program, there, whether it's our own three centers abroad or whether we're using, for example, we have two internship programs we use in London, and they have internship coordinators that, that manage all of this and, and make sure it happens properly. So when there's a program where there's an internship as part of the program, there's always all that. that that's part of what we evaluate when we're looking at programs that offer internships. Is, is there the appropriate, um, is there appropriate academic component? There has to be a seminar that they attend that's about the internship. Um, they have to write papers for that. They have to do all kinds of academic work in order to get the credit, and there has to be. Yeah, and as you may know, that, that's just a, just the same as if they were doing an internship credit in the U.S., right? There are academic supervision components that are and that's, that's, part of the regs. And that's where, you know, when I came to AU, there were internships in a lot of places, but they were all over the map in terms of what students were doing and how much credit, what they had to do, and it was really kind of a big old mess. We only have like a standard form. Um, and now, correct. and thanks to working closely with Gihan and having him visit some of our sites, we regularized it, we've got syllabi, we've got requirements, and it's all it's pretty, I mean, it's, there's still. I mean, I'll just things. say, you know, when I started here, the, the academic regulations on internships were in place, but were largely being observed in the breach. <laughs> you know, so there was little supervision by faculty of internships, et cetera. And I have to say, in the last five, six years, we have really made it a more rigorous system. And I, I, I'm not saying that to give myself credit uh, by any means. There's been a huge uh, focus legally on what is allowed uh, for internships uh, that are unpaid versus paid and full credit versus not, and what all the requirements are that go with that. Um, a related point to your question, which was exactly what you asked, is what about the student who wants to do an internship that isn't for credit, right, while they're on their site? And we sort of touched on this, but, um, and you might at first, and my first reaction was like, of course, we should be able to do that. That's great. You know, most of our students are doing internships not for credit. They're not taking them uh, necessarily for credit here while, while at AU. So why shouldn't they be able to do this? And in, in conversation with Sarah, really came to the understanding that while the student is there, as she was just saying, the, the first obligation is the is the word study and study abroad, not the yes. abroad piece, right? And so to be able to fit in um, a non-credit internship in a way that fits around your academic obligations uh, is often very tough to do. And then beyond that, particularly in countries like London, uh, like the UK, and, and several of the European countries in which we have programs, just getting authorization to be able to do an internship at all is an extraordinarily complicated process. It's not just something you can just show up and do that the employer will be happy to have you. Right? So, uh, so for both those reasons, we discourage um, doing that. It's not an absolute ban, as Sarah was saying, a lot of but we, will, we prefer that they work yeah. through the program director uh, to even even if that is a not for credit. And actually a lot of programs discourage it for another reason, which is if students, and it's the same with community service practice, because what's been found is if students are doing it not for credit abroad, they start off with the great intent, oh, I want to volunteer at this local women's shelter. But 
they're abroad for the semester, all their friends are traveling every weekend, and suddenly they're busy with everything else, and they start off with all these good intentions, and then they just stop showing up. And that creates a lot of ill will. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, it's just students, they just bite up more than they can chew. And, you know, I understand we were all young once and, and did things like that and behaved as well as we should. You know, I won't elaborate on that, <laughs> but, you know, we know this happens. And so we would rather, if students are engaging in these activities, that it's, it's an official part of their program for which they're going to get some credit because then they'll keep to the commitment. I mean, it's been hard enough actually in Brussels. We have some students who haven't shown up for their internships and they're, they're doing this for credit and it's, you know, it, it happens and, you know, but at least if they're doing it for credit, you can crack down on it. If it's a free time thing um, and they stop showing up to somewhere that has been relying on them, that's just bad news. And we do talk to the students about that. Like, don't do this if you don't intend to follow through. Next, but one final question in terms of timing. How far in advance should students plan if they do want to do an internship while they're studying abroad? Um, with, with your office, with your office, how far yeah. in advance should they coordinate all so, um, so if it is a program that, if it's an internship that exists through the study abroad experience, right, that it's then it's preset and there will be very clear uh, lines and that'll vary a little bit by program, right, Sarah? It's or basically it's part of the program. So it's part of the application process, so the right? Application so you're, process. as you're signing up for your study abroad experience, you're going okay. to have similarly questions that you're going to have to respond to about what kind of intentions, etc. Yeah. You are. Those programs have as part of their application process um, forms that they fill out about their interests for an internship, what their background is. Um, listing things in order of preference, so, you know, and, and then lots of materials that are supposed to read about the need to be flexible about their placement and so forth. So it's all just part of the program. Um, and so for all of the students who are doing it for credit, it's part of the program and, and it's, it, it just happens. And it's generally the semester before. In terms of deciding whether or not they want to do that, you know, the earlier the better. We, we would like to see students thinking about it in their first year at AU. And we work very closely with the academic advising team so that students will think about, do I want to study abroad? And according to what I'm studying here at AU and what I'm doing here at AU, when's the best semester for me to study abroad? How am I going to fit it in? Do I want to do an internship? Do I need courses for my major? You know, so they can plan and fit it all in. Um, you know, because if they don't want to do an internship, then they shouldn't go to Nairobi and they shouldn't go to Brussels because they're the internships required. Um, and again, if they want to do an internship in the UK, they'll pretty much have to go on the program run by an American institution rather than to a British university because British universities don't do internships for credit for the most part. So, you know, then they have to decide if I go in the American program, I'm going to be taking classes that all with American students at the program center and doing an internship. And then what I'm giving up is the wide range of classes on offer at say UCL in London and the ability to take classes with British students. You know, they have to they have to balance this out. So the sooner they start thinking about it, the better. And graduate students are that's a whole different Graduate yeah. students are a whole different ball of class. Um, I do want to draw attention to our, our last slide. Um, because you know these things need to be talked through and discussed and you you do end up making a lot of compromises or changing your mind about what you thought you were going to do um and hashing out all these things like do you want to try doing a short program which has serious financial constraints for students frankly it's easier for undergraduates to go in a semester financially so you know what are we going to try but talking through all of that and i will say there's there's one thing about the slide which is a little bit dishonest um, which is that we don't meet over coffee. We go to al dente happy hour and meet over a nice glass of wine. <laughs> and we found that to be, I mean, it, extremely it, productive. It's very productive. I mean, you know, we meet after hours. We, you know, we got to know each other really well. We didn't at the start, you know, but we right. got thrown together to work together. And we thought, let's go, let's just go have a drink and talk, just brainstorm. And getting outside the university, not in one of our offices, away from your, your office phone, your colleagues, go and have, you know, if we want to go to Starbucks to have a drink there, but I mean, it was just nice to go at the end of the day, 
have a drink, maybe have a little pizza, and talk and talk and talk. And that has been not only very enjoyable in getting to know each other, developing friendships, but it has been, we found, the most productive way. Because when you're relaxed, I think your brain functions much more creatively. And I really do. It's it's and it's not just relaxing because of the wine, although that helps me for sure. But it, it I think it's it's just getting away. Yeah, that's a fun thing that happens. I mean, yeah. we said it somewhat jokingly, but it truly has been one of the the best sort of pieces of collaboration and ways in which I think we have been able to do that. Um, in a in a related way, I will say that the, you know a point we've been making and that Sarah really emphasized about doing these site evaluation trips together uh, and kind of going to the site collectively. So we typically spend three, four days right on site and we're with each other from, you know, 7.30 in the morning when we meet for breakfast through till 10 at night. And, and you know, every minute is scheduled typically. I'm sure the site directors love it when we're coming down. <laughs> They're planning these schedules for so us. Happy when we leave. But, um, but that also creates like this, you know, in addition to working through all the problems, we have some personal bonding, which I think is incredibly valuable in terms of our ability then when we come back to continue to work through problems together. Because you're going to have disagreements. Absolutely. And sometimes these are quite serious disagreements. And so if you haven't developed a good relationship with a colleague, it makes those disagreements so unpleasant and, and much harder to resolve. Um, when when you've developed this kind of relationship, there's then a level of trust in each other's expertise, in each other's goodwill. You know, you are all working towards the same goal, and and you you can feel free to argue because nobody's going to take offense. Um, and I I find that that's been essential to the best programs we have is the ability to to grapple with the difficult things, and you can't do that if you don't trust them. Um, you've got to develop those relationships. Um, you, they don't have to become your best friend, but you need to have good relationships with these people because these programs are very intense, and it's a huge responsibility to send these students into a place like Kibera and feel good about it, um, and to know that you can trust everyone you work with to keep your students safe, to give them a good academic experience, to ensure they don't fall behind in their, in their requirements that they use so that they don't graduate on time. All of these things are our responsibility with these programs, and we're all in it together. Um, you know, I just went with Christine and, and Matthew Meekins from SIS to, to Cairo, and yeah, we were together. It was really 7 a.m. until 10 at night. Yeah, <laughs> it really was. And, um, and it was fabulous to be all together because um, I also feel because these schedules are so intense when you're doing these site visits that you get really tired. And there are times when I'm sitting in meetings, especially if the room gets hot, and I just zone out. Okay. You know, and maybe you know, 50 minutes go by, and I, and I suddenly come to, and I don't remember what's been said. Um, if, and it, what's great when you're with people is that you don't tend to zone out at the same time. So at the end, <laughs> so at the end of the day, you know, people can fill in your gaps, or if you've encountered something that that bothers you. And you know, for sake of politeness, you're not going to say it right there in the meeting, but you can come back to your hotel afterwards and say to your colleagues, well, what did you think about the way somebody behaved or what you learned or what you saw? And to get that kind of ability to hear other people's perspectives, which could be very different from your own. You know, you could be totally mistaken in what you assumed was happening. And so that, to me, um, I do a lot of, I don't try to do now, but I do site visits a lot. I've done a lot. I've done them by myself. I've done them with colleagues. It's so much better to go with colleagues from the intellectual work standpoint as well as just the social pleasantness of having someone. Another question. Yeah. So, do I mean, any of these places, do you, do you have like multiple departments working together? A place like Nairobi, for instance, I've been there because that's where the headquarters is the United Environment Program. So there's so much climate expertise there. Climate's the link between environmental health and classic public health. And I can't speak for my department, I'm just an adjunct, but you know, in some cases it may be expanding the subject. It would be far easier than trying to establish a new one. In Cairo, there's a ton going on. Yeah, yeah. We, we have expanded in Nairobi just in the last year a new 
environment, it's called environment and human health. So we're expanding a little bit in the environment area. We, we had a couple of tries at that that frankly failed for a whole bunch of reasons that, you know, we developed a really good program option in environmental studies and we just didn't get enrollment. Um, you know, you learn, you, you do have failures that happen too. But we, so then we decided to branch out a little bit from the public health and join that. And ultimately, we may then extend it because that's working. That one's working. Um, so yeah, it's easier when we, and we have these centers, which means that it's fairly cost effective for us now to develop a new program track. And if it fails, we aren't going to lose a ton of money. Um, so we, we're now hitting the point where we're at capacity at that site. So if we expand it again, we're going to need a big, bigger program center, and that's a lot of money. So you know, you run into that. But yeah, and in Cairo, that was one of the attractive things that we're talking about, maybe developing a short program. I mean, that's why I chose this, because we're actually thinking about doing something like that for Cairo, maybe for graduate students. Yeah, that would be fabulous. Yeah. If you could. So, so for graduate students, well, at least in SOC, yeah. um, some of our programs are one year long. Yeah, and exactly. so students just don't have that opportunity. You get to go spring break right. or the December, right. you know, winter break, yeah. which, you know. So with all so. of our, our concerns about Cairo in terms of safety and things, we were thinking actually a contained yeah. shorter program, possibly for graduate level students. Okay, that's fabulous. I'd love to be involved in this. Okay, great. <laughs> and I work with graduate yeah, students. Yeah, it's been great. Fairly, not not exclusively at AU, Sarah's shop. Uh, works with the undergraduate students. Yeah. We have a few, but not very many. In graduate students, I would say traditional study abroad numbers, where they enroll for a semester, they're much lower than they used exactly. to be. And like also at the undergraduate level, most of our work is short term work. Yeah. So I'm always happy to yeah, have you about some ideas. I'm just retired on the call for that. That's great. Yeah. Well, I think the next kind of level is for humans to collaborate on a program, on a program that would be international in itself, um, that would take students to, uh, you know, two weeks here, two weeks there, two weeks, you know, with the international, global, whatever, executive MBA or something like that. That's, at least when I worked at Georgetown, we created one with the school of foreign service and the business school. That's so happening that's, here. Yeah, yeah, and so that's what, kind of, that's the next progression for these types of partnerships is to take it from a pure study broad experience into a much bigger program, you know, MA or MBA level. So, anyway, thank you all very thank much. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.